its open life. Um, you may have seen in the abstract that uh, I was planning to present the result of some research I was meant to carry out. Uh, unfortunately, I was very ambitious when I drafted the abstract, <laughs> and the results of the research are not ready yet. It's a fully fledged research proposal, and it's ready to go. I even have a research system for it and everything. But I cannot send you the results. Uh, what I will do instead is to talk more generally about the uh, project Open Lives because uh, looking at uh, the audience, I know that uh, not everybody here has heard about it, or I can imagine that not everybody has heard about it. Uh, looking at the digital, uh, sorry, about the ethical uh, aspects of a student digital production uh, in the project Open Lives, and then by talking about this future, this coming soon research project, hopefully I will be able to um, help others uh, perhaps to think about their content creation strategies uh, from an ethical perspective. So um, we talk about students as co-creators of uh, digital content. Uh, we, we know other initiatives, students as producers who which, which obviously um, has a lot of resonances with uh, the idea of students creating, uh, creating content. Uh, and uh, we know that many of our students in our modules um, are supposed to uh, share with external audiences uh, digital assets produced by themselves. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes this is a requirement of the course, sometimes it's compulsory, sometimes even though the word compulsory is not there because of the platform that is used or the dynamics of the course, it's inevitable that students will have to share. Uh, but I wanted to ask uh, the audience now, um, have you ever put yourselves in the position of those students? We should put in the, ourselves in the position of those, those students because uh, mm, sometimes uh, they don't feel inclined to share, they don't want to share, uh, they don't want to share with that wider audience. So we need to understand the reasons why they would not share and uh, also mm, think about what happens when, when somebody in a group decides not to share, not to publish, mm, what happens to that person academically, personally, um, socially. So our digital content uh, creation courses and uh, our practice have to be mindful of uh, students' feelings hmm, and be ethical. Of course, um, uh, there are some disciplines in which, in which uh, sharing publicly is, is very, very well rooted. Uh, if I think about arts and design disciplines, students mm, routinely participate in exhibitions and, and that's considered as an essential part. But uh, that, uh, that uh, personal drive and that uh, aspiration of artists uh, to share with others is not always there uh, in, many other, in many other disciplines. And, and uh, you know, perhaps we should learn a little bit more about uh, the way in which these things are done in disciplines other than uh, mine, uh, arts and humanities, uh, modern languages and cultures, but it also applies to social science and many other disciplines. Uh, I don't want to sound like a party puppet for digital content creation, you know. I'm radically, I'm radically in favour of uh, students creating more and more content and I'm mindful, I'm, I'm aware of the transformational potential uh, that a student creation has. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's so. Uh, I, I have written uh, an article I'm going to show you here uh, called Liberation in Open Lives Critical Pedagogy, Empowerability and Critical Action. So, uh, I, I want you to understand from the beginning that my position is one of supporting content creation by students and uh, putting the right principles uh, in this educational transformation. 
but ethics are important. Uh, Alison uh, Little John was saying yesterday that universities need to uh, need to transform, need to open much radically. Uh, but there is a process of acculturation, as uh, um, Alan, I think Alan talked yesterday about acculturation. There is a process of acculturation into the openness uh, that our students have to undergo. And that process has to be ethically smooth. So let me tell you now about uh, Open Lives, the project Open Lives. Uh, it's a um, project funded by GISC. Thank you, GISC. <laughs> and, uh, it was a project led by uh, the University of Southampton and there were two other universities in partnership, the University of Leeds and the University of, Southam of Portsmouth. Uh, the project Open Life started in the year 2011 and uh, the main uh, outcome of the project was to create uh, a collection of interviews, oral history mm -hmm. interviews, uh, digitized in uh, the Homebox repository. Mm? The Homebox is the Arts and Humanities uh, uh, repository in the UK. Uh, and um, the, uh, the project Homebox uh, started when uh, Kate, uh, Kate Borthwick and other colleagues, Ali Dickens, uh, etc., uh, started to think uh, about the, the use that was being uh, given to uh, some interviews, a collection of interviews that uh, our colleague from Southampton, Alicia Pozo Gutierrez, had uh, collected. Uh, these interviews uh, were uh, meant to be used for, uh, for a book, a publication on, res uh, on Spanish migration and tales of return. And, uh, you know, people were quite upset about the fact that we were not giving full use eh, to these interviews. So there was a process in which uh, these interviews became uh, digital, digi digital objects uh, and that, that was uh, the main objective, the main outcome of the process of the project of Open Lives uh, to create this collection. But then, and that, that's how, that's for instance one of the uh, people who Alicia had interviewed, and uh, his life story is in Homebox now, and you can have also some ephemera that uh, have been given by the participant, by the, by the person interviewed, etc. That's what it looks like mm, in the repository. And then, and then we, we... A very important part of the... A very important part of this project was to create pedagogical applications used uh, for uh, these interviews. So my, uh, my job in the, in the project was to um, create a suite of pedagogical applications, open educational resources for um, people across the world who would like to use these interviews in their teaching. Uh, and uh, that included uh, anybody in social sciences, arts and humanities, geography, etc. Because uh, these uh, are very rich uh, materials. Uh, they are life experiences uh, of people who left Spain uh, any time from the end of the 1930s to um, the 1960s. And uh, as I said, it can be used for very different uh, disciplines. So, uh, in that uh, attempt to, to actually create something solid and valuable, my main contribution was actually a course, uh, a module or a unit, as it's called in other places. And this module was called, it's called Open Lives, it's currently running, it's running this year for the second time, and it's one of the options of our students in final year in all the BA in Spanish. Um, it is an optional module, it has a cap of 15 students and uh, you know, it was oversubscribed, uh, very popular, thankfully, in this second year. And um, it is presented as a, as a Spanish professional skills language, but obviously it's so much more than that and uh, I'll tell you a little bit in a minute. 
Um, so what do students do in this, uh, in this module? From the point of view of creation of content and sharing that content, there are different circles, different um, scenarios in which students share. Um, at the end, they are supposed to share in the home box, but there are other, obviously there are other instances of sharing uh, during in the smaller, more restricted circles during the during the course, and um, what you have there is a rather awkward uh, diagram with the indication of a student outputs and how they relate to each other. And uh, if you look at the uh, at the top on the right, uh, in semester one, in semester one, students. Uh, do learn about uh, research ethics, oral history, Spanish migration, Spanish economy, uh, using uh, OER produced um, with the interviews in the repository in mind. And they are OER that are related to those interviews and they use the interviews themselves as materials. Um, at the end of uh, semester one, the students have to, have to present a uh, reflection, an academic reflection using academic style of writing uh, and academic conventions. They do everything in Spanish, by the way, but it's academic. So they present this academic research report on what they have learned and what their objectives as researchers are in the course. And then I give feedback to that research report, and then they share their reports and their reflections. Uh, they share them orally in the classroom with everybody else. And um, at the beginning of semester two, uh, students um, engage in the process of interviewing new migrants in Leeds, people who have come to Leeds from Spain uh, because of economic reasons, or who are uh, in, in, in Leeds uh, and they do not want to go back or they cannot go back to Spain because of economic reasons. So uh, these uh, interviews are carried out by the students. The whole process of recruiting the, uh, the participants is done uh, as a team uh, and uh, students participate in the, in the revamping of the uh, questionnaires, consent forms, etc. So we record these interviews and then uh, students uh, have to produce a documentary, one documentary per student, in which they have to incorporate um, uh, extracts from the new interviews and the old interviews to produce an audio file that is usually about 20 minutes. Uh, and the, for me, the important thing is that um, the students have absolute freedom in terms of modes of expression. So we break with the idea that the essay is the only and quintessential uh, genre of uh, human intellect. Mm? Produc intellectual production is not, of course. Uh, and that's, that's sometimes very difficult because the students, mm, after so many years of schooling and university, they do not see uh, academic or intellectual value in any other forms of production than essays, even though they may be students of literature and they are used to read other types of genres, but the academic genre of the essay uh, is uh, over overpowering. So they have plenty of freedom and uh, we talk and, and actually learn about genre and about different modes of expression. And then when they submit that script, uh, I read it, I give feedback, get it back to them, and then they have to uh, incorporate that feedback and record the whole thing, the, the, the documentary. And uh, that's the final output. So, these, uh, to recap, there are two student produced publishable outcomes. The life stories interviews, they are not assessed, but they are essential because the students have to use them uh, for their documentaries. And then, the audio documentary, 2,500 words, and uh, there is a script, and then there is a final version that they have to record with Audacity or anything else, 
that they want to use. So going back to uh, the ethical uh, track, in what, in what ways is uh, open life ethical? Well, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a form of character education, if you want, and I know that many people do not agree with uh, character education. Of course, I have a very clear idea uh, of the differences between character education uh, and indoctrination. This is not indoctrination, it's character education. And uh, a very important thing to bear in mind is that in many institutions, including mine, ethics is a very important um, component in the learning experience of a student. In, fa in fact, in our, in our institution, ethics is one of the three pillars of the, of the academic curriculum institutionally. Hmm? So, um, yeah, there are, there, there are many, ways of, uh, many ways in which open lives is, is ethical. Um, we have, um, in a way, we have a response hmm, to uh, the practices of marketization uh, by way of um, engaging students with uh, production of uh, socially meaningful and personally meaningful content. And uh, yeah, the students have to uh, think about uh, questions such as the uh, purpose of research and uh, the impact of research be beyond academia. The, um, the other question is that there is a form of uh, cross-pollination between uh, students and members of the community on a topic like economic migration that uh, is very much related to uh, questions that the generation of our students will have to deal with, like the crisis of capitalism. And uh, I don't have to say in what ways OIA are ethical or promote uh, a, a more ethic education or ethical education. Um, if we think about this process of production of research-based digital assets, um, I like to think of uh, the metaphor of the of the um, uh, trade farmer or the organic farmer, uh, somebody who produced their own uh, research primary data and um, ends up, you know, uh, selling it or offering it, sharing it with others. In this case, sharing it with others uh, because they are um, uh, incorporating uh, this research into uh, non-academic. Uh, forms of communication. Um, so what is the ethical framework for our module? Um, first of all, uh, the module is uh, focused on production and publication. Everything that we do uh, is geared towards uh, making the students feel prepared to publish uh, responsibly, ethically, the uh, product of their work and uh, in that respect uh, I forgot to say that we obviously have a session on open educational resources the students read the articles and the literature on this module and uh, they learn about copyright etc creative commons licenses so everything is is set as if mm, the final goal of the module is to publish but we don't talk about the when are you going to press the button there is no pressure and there's no talk about actually publishing uh, as individuals uh, the personal decision of what you're going to do with your documentary at the end. So when does that window of opportunity to publish opens in, in our module? Uh, when the marks are final, when the student um, knows that that is the result of the, of the documentary, the, the mark that they obtain. And obviously the student is meant to be the name alpha of the of the uh, documentary, and uh, because it's published in the home box that has profiles, hmm, it means that the student will put the picture and say who they are if they want to, etc. And uh, but after um, after graduation, uh, when I lose any kind of editorial powers, uh, the uh, window of opportunity to publish is closed. Hmm. I mean, all this is very, very much debatable. Uh, this is a solution that I found following discussions with colleagues and um, 
you know, I asked the, the lawyer, the legal advisor of the university, and uh, he was happy with this arrangement, and this is compliant as well with our OER policy. But, you know, I'm mindful that perhaps this is very restrictive for many people here. So, why is this ethically sound in our context? Uh, well, the students concentrate on learning, on producing, and uh, there is not so much fear uh, of revealing learning intimacies, weaknesses, uh, in very open or external circles. I'm conscious that part of the learning is actually learning about sharing and learning about being exposed eh, to these circles. Mm? But there is a progression, and as I said, this is a, a, um, a, a process. Uh, we, we avoid uncomfortable situations of students wanting to please me. Mm? So I know you are an OER enthusiast, blah, 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 so I'm going to publish because that perhaps may give me better standing when it comes to, you know, uh, a borderline result between a two, one and a first. I don't want that type of situation. If people want to share, they, they can share, but I don't want people trying to, to look good. Um, it's definitely their decision. And, and uh, we don't create a two-tier classroom by having some people who said, well, I, I, I publish and I don't. So, yeah, there is a place for everybody. Um, we understand that uh, in not engaging, not participating, not sitting in the front row, mm -hmm. It's something that uh, has a lot of uh, cultural uh, components there, why it happens, but, you know, there is also a psychological, personal underpinning why people do not want to be exposed in certain situations. And, and of course, um, uh, it's, it's all very, very much um, to do with both the culture and your, your personality. Uh, implications for the future research? Well, I, I'm interested in, uh, first of all, finding out the interactions between these uh, ethical um, controls uh, or frameworks and uh, curriculum design, because it depends on how this, uh, you know, uh, whatever you can, solutions you can think of will have implications in the way in which you design the tasks. Uh, I want to find out what the students feel uh, the past last year's students uh, feel uh, about the fear of publication or the encouragement to publish or the way in which they felt at different stages of the module because this is something that changes because uh, in order to be ethical we need to understand what their fears and their concerns are and then obviously uh, I'd like to uh, fine-tune this ethical framework, uh, very simple ethical framework that I designed uh, in my module and help others hmm, to design theirs if they feel they have to. And uh, that's everything. Thank you very much. Hi, Tony. Hello, um, so Alison. We talked briefly about Lindsay. this last night, Lindsay, yeah. Um, and my question for you is, uh, with what will be really interesting to find from your research, I imagine, is um, how this kind of almost ambiguity at the start about whether they were going to publish or not um, kind of had perhaps a negative impact on, on the number of people who would actually be ready to publish at the end of the, the course. And, and perhaps whether that matters, I suppose. Because um, if they're not explicitly preparing for publication from the start, then it, it may be that they, they feel less ready at the end. <laughs> so that's my question. You. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There is a, uh, there is a problem with that. Uh, and um, I try to uh, not to talk about individual decisions, but I try to promote publication, of course. And uh, one of the things that I have told the students is that they can use uh, last year's documentaries that were published. Not all of them were published, by the way. Last year, uh, out of eight students, uh, three published, mm -hmm. which is not bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I told the students all the time, please look at the documentaries of last year. You can use those documentaries as well eh, as part of your uh, extracts for your own, uh, for your own documentary uh, and try to you know, be positive about publication. But yeah, you're right. If they, they're, they're, I'm sure there are some students already who know definitely they're not going to publish, 
and uh, you know perhaps their learning is different. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting uh, project, uh, Thank Antonio. You. <laughs> you don't mind me calling you Antonio? Do you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the productions—they are individually put together by students. I'm wondering, the three out of eight that you had that published, yeah. if the amount, the numbers would go up if you had students working in groups, perhaps. Hmm. If, if I had the students, the students working groups for the transcriptions of the interviews, for the preparation of the uh, questionnaires and all the ethical protocol paperwork, they work in groups in the interviews, but uh, if they had to work uh, as authors in the documentary together, um, it would be a bit more difficult for me. It would present a lot of difficulties in terms of finding the right way to assess it, dealing with uh, potential grievances, grievances within groups, um, and making sure that everybody's happy for their name to be there. And I'm open to suggestions. What do you think? Well, I think it's worth exploring, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know what. The yeah, would perhaps be, we could have a, we could have a two options. One of them is an individual documentary, and another one is a, is a, the option of having a, a collective documentary. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, for the States, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for a superb presentation of a great project. This is a really, really hard conference slot to do, so I just want people to appreciate quite how good that was, really. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And my question is a, uh, actually a rather boring practical one. Um, making documentaries from clips of various uh, sources of video is... Uh, sorry, it's audio, audio. It's audio, even audio, is really, really, really hard. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of this happen in the uh, uh, DS106 course. We get the, the, the groups of students uh, uh, together to produce audio that's not necessarily a documentary that can be anything, and even that is very difficult. Uh, what support do you give students in the practices of uh, Firstly, audio editing and creation, and secondly, the art of the uh, kind of audio documentary, the that particularly genre of storytelling. Oh, yeah. Well, the first, first of all, um, what I do is I have Audacity as the default tool that they can use, and my experience last year was that uh, by putting them two hours in a well, it was an hour actually an hour in the classroom. Obviously they had to see the videos of Audacity, understand what it is, but I put them together in a classroom uh, and I put them in groups, the ones that are uh, perhaps more competent in, in, with the software or, or more inclined to learn fast, uh, mixed with people who don't feel so confident and they have to bring their files and in an hour they all came out hmm, having the basics and then uh, we only have 20 teaching weeks, and I know it's, it's hard, but all, everybody presented something that in terms of uh, the putting together the sounds and the clips was, was professional. So uh, I didn't have to do much, to be honest. I was a bit scared about this, but it's fine. And then uh, the, the other question is very important, because we, uh, in higher education, and uh, in particular in languages modules, we sometimes kind of train students to produce very complex, convoluted sentences, you know, uh, particularly in modern foreign languages when students have to learn about syntactic subordination. Mm? Uh, it looks like if the more, the more subordinate clauses that you throw in into a paragraph, the more <laughs> badges you, 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 you earn. And obviously that is not the case for uh, uh, writing a documentary that is yeah. meant to be listened. So first of all, students have to define very clearly who their audience is, because that has an impact in their style. Then we look at samples, uh, we look at paragraphs and try to rewrite them uh, and make them stylistically better. But uh, I'm always clear that um, all depends on your 
mm, take on the documentary and your the more the different the combination of modes of expressions mm, that you have for your documentary and the, the genres that you are looking at if you want to get the inspiration in a particular genre and your audience are key mm, to understand what type of style you want when it comes to writing and displaying the information but it is uh, you know I've become a jack of all trades mm? I'm here talking about oral history research methods Spanish migration crisis of capitalism in Spain uh, open educational resources and now I'm also uh, using uh, learning resources designed by other people uh, for my students to learn how to write something that can be read and another, another important thing that nobody mentions these audio documentaries are meant to be read okay so students have to see. have you ever thought how many of our students in higher education are actually good or at you know sitting in front of a microphone and reading in a way in which you the listener can say oh I'm enjoying this it is a professional skill and it's something that we don't we don't cultivate so I you know I have I have to work with the students in, in actually let's sit down read this loud let's see how it sounds let's see where you put the different uh, intonation curves and it's in Spanish as well so it's challenging it's challenging uh, we get in there we get in there I think uh, uh, you need uh, a lot of determination uh, to do something like this and in many of the presentations I've done about about this I talk about the the type of um, challenges that it has for the for, for the teacher Can, can I ask, do you have any advice for me about the ethics? Do you think that's a good framework or is it a bit restrictive? One negative comment about my own module is that because of the research ethics uh, protocols uh, in the relationship between the people who interview and the students, hmm, uh, I'm struggling to create communities of practice. When the students are kind of encouraged or allowed to engage personally with the interviewees, uh, the module is finished because uh, the interviewees are research uh, participants who have a choice on whether their name go goes on or not, who can change their mind about whether we publish the interview or not, which has a, actually a knockdown, knock-on effect on the documentary. So, you know, have a number of rules of engagement of students with participants, which you know, it's logical if you think that some of them are the same age and, you know, we are all human beings and things can happen and I don't want, you know, personal relationships to <laughs> spoil the work of, of the group. So that's my little sorrow, yeah? communities of practice. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to echo David's uh, tribute to Antonio for, for giving us a really excellent start off this morning. So thank you. Once thank again. you.